Guys, I've got no way to introduce this list. This might just be the best year for modern gaming in my life. Well, I don't say that as if it was all rainbows and sunshine. Some games didn't hit as hard as we'd like, and there was a lot of talk surrounding loot boxes and... Dark Souls. You guys have played other video games, right? But for real, 2017 was so good, not just because of how great these games are, but for how many we got. Normally, it's hard for me to keep up with modern releases, but this year, I swear to heck, games like Injustice 2, Persona 5, Crash Insane, Horizon Zero Dawn, Sonic Mania, heck, games I actually have, but not enough playtime to really form a solid opinion, like Hollow Knight and Tekken 7. Guys, I tried my best, just give me another 10 years. I would have loved to fill an entire list with 2017 exclusives. I probably could if I really tried. But as usual, there are other games that I want to give mention to. You know, after doing these kinds of lists year by year, I begin wondering how many ways I can say the same thing over and over again. Maybe next year I'll start by doing something cool, like committing tax evasion. You'll know innovative video making when you see it. In most circumstances, I play the games I do because, well, I feel like it. It's just that there are those games that look fun, and if once in a blue moon I have the cash, I'll play it. Maybe. Very rarely is there a game that I play out of obligation, but leave it to a friend of mine to stream himself playing a Disney MMO called Toontown, make his avatar a duck under my alias, and spawn a living nightmare. Although it took me a while to actually play the damn game, I can't just ignore it after getting a folder of almost 60 drawings of a character that... I never asked for. So, I asked my parents permission, because you have to, you rabble rousers, played it, and... Yeah, why did I have as much fun as I did? Well, technically, this isn't Toontown, rather a rewritten version made by an insane group of fans after Disney shut down the original. And for a game with that in mind, I'm not only surprised, but kinda freaked out. There were people that cared that much about a Disney MMO. Oh, okay. But I also feel strangely nostalgic about Toontown Rewritten. Not that it brings back memories of me playing it, it probably wouldn't be on this list otherwise, but rather that classic, not fully functioning online gameplay takes me back to the days when I played RuneScape. Just taking the world around me, leveling up my character, dicking around with my friends. That was fun, I can't wait for Toontown 2. Toontown, rather. <laughs> Yeah, this is the shit you're subscribed to. But that level of freedom of doing whatever I want in a multiplayer RPG setting is what resonates with me. I could kill robots with some pies and a squirt gun, or I could be playing mini games with my friends, or taking care of my own doodle, or glitching beyond the reality of my house. Only the best games have the fewest restrictions, am I right? So at this rate, I might as well reserve a spot on these kinds of lists for a Jackbox title. And to be honest, why shouldn't I? As long as you got the people to play it, it can be some very fun party horseshit. And Jackbox games have that air of quality and quantity for their party packs. There is a lot to choose from this year, but I felt like I had to choose Trivia Murder Party for this list. With the many, many types of games Jackbox produces, there's never been a shortage of ideas. And I don't see that happening anytime soon, but at some point there's gotta be a game that takes many aspects of previous titles and combines them onto its own. And if there's ever a game to do it, this one. Jackbox games have always had a knack for making games revolving around useless trivia really interesting. And this time around, imagine if you're in the Saw universe, but playing with a flamboyant jigsaw. You know, I wish I was kidding, but... Welcome to Trivia Night, a perfect storm of unholy truths. But it's also an affordable vacation for the whole family. Of course, with a name like Trivia Murder Party, you need some choice punishments for not knowing shit about... Girl Scout cookies, I don't know. Well, how about a load of mini games such as Rock, Paper, Scissors or Rapidly Answering Math Questions, or callbacks to other Jackbox titles like Quiplash and Drawful? Some of these mini games are what you expect, but the chance to actively negotiate with your fellow players in order to not die could make a friendly experience, but most of the time it'll end with ruined friendships with this side of Mario Party. Hell, 9 times out of 10, if you get the answer wrong, you have to have a finger cut off that will actually take away a choice for the answer. Usually, it's the correct answer that's going to be restricted. Every game typically ends with a last stretch mini game where you have to escape the door with rapid fire trivia questions but the twist is that dead players could have their souls back and steal the victory of course being a guy that hasn't won a single game i also have a bit of a vendetta for this game and anyone that plays it i have enough urges to resist as is don't don't do this I have, I guess, a theory, and I realize I'm likely not the only one who's thought of this, but it's a little theory regardless. Have you ever thought about how you can connect a person's personality, or character, so to speak, with the things they like? Maybe if you like open world games, you have a desire to travel, or if you like Fire Emblem, the only thing you like more is to argue with people. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but I say it anyway because for me, 2017 was a year of self-discovery. Nah, oh, but who am I to kid? That's just a more wholesome way of saying that this year has completely ruined my life. Kids, don't do it. I'll do this with X amount of retweets a part of your life, you'll be surprised at how much it'll change you. I 
like most of my friends was on the whole love live is trash and you're trash for liking it train until 2017 came in and hit me with a truckload of karma and ever since I've never been the same. With something as popular as love live you expect there to be a video game of some kind and oh look at that. I'm gonna be honest I struggle to get into mobile games. I don't really care about Super Mario Run or Fire Emblem Heroes and while games like Miitomo, Pokemon Go, and Animal Crossing Pocket Camp were fun they couldn't really keep my attention forever. A mobile game about cute auto girls is as simplistic as it gets. It's a rhythm game to the actually amazing soundtrack of each group, and there's even a super simplistic story mode with the original scenarios. There's all sorts of variables to boost your high score, such as different attributes and boosting your rank on whoever you scout for, but I think the simplicity works best. It's kind of hard for me to explain, but if I play a game on my phone, I'll likely be at a place that will inevitably require my attention. Why deal with a bunch of random horse shit when I can go in, get my free items, play a song or two, hopefully scout for the only two girls that matter in my life, and then close the app feeling satisfied. And all it took was this game, 52 episodes, and a movie for me to crumble. Nah, I think it was worth it. If I haven't already filled out the hypothetical dialogue in the game of the year countdown bingo card thing, well, get a load of this. In any other year, this would have been number one. But considering that the year was so intent on spoiling me, I had to make some space. As a diehard fan of this franchise, having the newest entry this low did some interesting things to my emotions. So with that in mind, let's talk about Pokemon again. I think the biggest thing to consider is Game Freak's usual formula of releasing one set of games and then releasing them again not too long after. And I'd be lying if Pokemon Ultra Sun and Pokemon Ultra Moon made my outlook on that a little less positive. I mean, even when you consider some of the noticeable technical improvements that Crystal, Emerald, and Platinum brought, it's essentially mostly the same adventure until the new box art Pokemon has another say in that. However, even if I consider that most of my issues with Sun and Moon haven't been fixed in Ultra, and regardless of how substantial the new content is, I would essentially be playing my favorite games of 2016 all over again, and I could invest time and money on many worse things. While the story of Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon remains mostly unchanged, as someone that finds enjoyment in the battle mechanics, adding some move tutors and giving Pokemon some new bells and whistles is more than enough for me, but even the story mode is more noticeably difficult, with stronger trainer rosters and strategies to work around, and new totem Pokemon that may or may not be more horseshit. And heck, even for casual players, you might be able to find enjoyment out of the Mantine surfing, or the massive amounts of features in the Alola Voto Club, or being able to catch all the legendaries, or even the most amazing post-game story out of any game in the series. Gosh, damn it, Game Freak, you make me reluctant on buying your expansions, and then you add these crazy cool features and make me part of the problem. I, I, I'm, I'm not a drone. You know nothing, human. You guys know me, I like to take certain creative liberties with my videos. If I can find any loopholes, you bet I'll try to take them because they're my videos. I make the rules and then I break the rules and then reinvent the rules. Although I did try to be fair because in many technicalities, I have already played this game in a different year and even talked about it in one of these lists. However, those same technicalities are also telling me that Shovel Knight's latest expansion was also sold separately from the main game. And considering how Shovel Knight campaigns are noticeably different as is, I think I'll do it anyway. Let me know what you're gonna do about it. With 2015's Plague of Shadows, the story was mostly the same, but giving a character that is a complete contrast to Shovel Knight in character and in gameplay allowed your outlook on most of the game's challenges to change drastically. Spectre of Torment changed pretty much everything about the core game of Shovel Knight, not just with a new perspective to play as, but also from aesthetics to completely remixed music tracks right down to it being a prequel. With a new story to tell, it allows levels and bosses to be redesigned, but when playing a Spectre Knight, it's almost as if you're playing a completely different game. Is it just me, or does it feel like a lot of these boss fights seem to put up even more of a fight before Shovel Knight came into the picture? But hey, when you're jumping from ship to ship battling Propeller Knight, or Tinker Knight throwing wrenches at you while being chased by a giant mech, or even Black Knight with his new turtle friend, it's all... Yes, please. Everything's designed around Spectre Knight with the wall climbing, his trinkets, and his massive scythe that can even grind on rails. There's even a cheat code that changes your wall climb to a wall jump that is a direct copy of Mega Man X. And we still have one more expansion left. I don't think my heart can take much more.
Whenever I see that next big game announcement that directly calls back to other games of the past or feature developers that worked on said classics, at this point I can really only look at it with concern. I remember way back when, when there were three big indie games coming up that perfectly fit that bill and we all thought were amazing and, oh, things were way more simple back then. Bloodstained, which we've either heard fuck all about or really just don't care that much anymore. Mighty Number no. 9, which... Fuck. And Ukulele, which wasn't as disastrous, but still pretty disappointing. We need someone to show these lamers how to not only call back to oldish video games, but also to make it really good. Someone that's cute as heck. I'd only heard about A Hat in Time earlier in 2017 and kind of just forgot about it for reasons I explained earlier. But then it was gifted to me at around the time I've been hearing constant praise of the game and my expectations were certainly higher, but I played a lot of games this year. It couldn't just be. It's one of my favorite indie games ever now. Good. You want to make a callback? This is how you make a callback. Like most people, I grew up with games like Mario Sunshine, and the bright poppy aesthetics, the type of movement techniques, the mostly massive worlds, it takes me back. But easily the biggest surprise was this level of variety that a hat in time offers. There's a lot of hats and badges to offer up a lot of different approaches to obstacles, such as an ice ground pound, slowing time to a crawl, a huge fuck ass laser, but the level variety is what takes center stage. In what games had you go through a murder mystery accompanied by some stealth, a boss fight with a giant porta potty, a lava cake, and even a- Fuck! All in the same game. And if you're that soulless enough to say that a hat in time doesn't have enough charm, Steam users have full mod support with custom levels and hats that actually play differently, and we're gonna get more chapters and even a co-op mode later down the line. Kickstarter projects are always tricky business, but I'll happily deal with another Mighty Number no. 9 and a ukulele if it means we can get another game like this. You know, jabbing at the whole, this game is the Dark Souls of... It used to be fun, and I guess sometimes it still is with how ridiculous people can stretch, but at this point, I would want to shift away from all that and instead gloat at the faces of people that probably have more gaming experience than I do at the fact that I can actually beat games like Cuphead. Granted, the game is one of those fuck you games, and I've grown a little tired of the get good phrase, but instead of complaining about games that people with a shred of patience can manage or making half-assed comparisons to other, much different games, you can fill in the rest. Thankfully, with a lot of indie games I played, they could be served as entry points to other genres, and playing Cuphead has made me curious on what other running gun shooters are like. But if Contra and Gunstar Heroes, for example, are anything like I've heard of, then I might be in trouble. But Cuphead's an interesting case because it's a lot less running and way more gunning. There are levels that do both jobs just fine, and you get coins to buy guns and charms, which only about half of them are really good. But the main game is taking on many creatively designed bosses that are a massive test of your patience and memorization of how they operate to make up for how short they are in the long run. However, I think the most interesting part about Cuphead to me is how I like to view it as a metaphor for what the devs at Studio NDHR went through to get this game even made. They had to risk their lives quitting their jobs and mortgaging their houses to make a game where Cuphead and his pal Mugman risked their lives to beat many of the devil's debtors after losing a gamble. Also, you ever heard of Hard Work Pays Off? Yeah, the devs had to painstakingly animate a 1930s cartoon and double the frame rate and received reward after another for making an incredible game. And Cuphead isn't exactly an easy game to get through and I sure as hell didn't feel empty inside after 11 hours and 400 deaths. Huh, I didn't expect to be on this deep of a train of thought for a game that's pretty much like Dark Souls. Oh, to hell and back with what I said earlier, it's still fun. Be honest looking back at the wii u was hmm i mean it wasn't a terrible console it sure had its hits but when comparing it to the wii it certainly wasn't a grand slam honestly i get the concerns with the switch's reveal and for a while i felt the same so what was nintendo's idea to alleviate this oh just releasing one of the greatest games of all time at launch of course you think more companies would have the same idea. Okay, calling it one of the greatest games of all time is absolutely a stretch coming from me. Seeing as how we're just cracking at the top three, but let me tell you, out of every countdown I've considered making, I've never had a top spot be this down in the wire, but oh, we gotta do what we gotta do. And if I can be a little critical, there's a lot of climbing you gotta do. I'm not too big of a fan of horse controls, and weapon durability is always kinda annoying to me, no matter how many weapons and weapon slots you pepper me with. But if it means I can even look at this game's beautiful environments by climbing something very high up and hang gliding everywhere I can, 
Yeah, I'll deal. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is open world in almost every sense imaginable. You can do almost anything in any order you want. Yeah, I could free up some of the divine beasts or upgrade my character or go straight for Ganon right out of the gate, but maybe a guy just wants to play with some chickens or play snowballing. There's a hell of a market behind that. Because of how much freedom you have, not only does that mean you can progress at however pace you like, and not only does it mean you don't have to worry too much about any rough difficulty spikes, but the level of possible planning you can make with how you want to tackle your adventure adds so much replay value, and this is a much welcome change from the relatively linear Zelda games for the past 30 years, if you really consider that an automatic problem. And of course, I can't neglect to mention that a game like this is available on the go, and is a stupidly successful launch title. Why couldn't you do that, Knack? Take some notes. One of my favorite things a game can do is incorporate RPG elements into its gameplay. Well, not automatically at least. Most of the problems that come with RPGs like grinding and farming and random horseshit like crits and status ailments, but typically when blended in with other genres, it's harder for me to have a problem with it because the more kinetic gameplay allows for a more primarily skill-based game at the cost of me being a bit on my guard. Maybe that's how it went in the Nier and Drakengard games, but... Oh, those didn't play too well. Honest question, did anyone ask for a new Nier? Maybe if you were into the lore, but it was announced at a time that I've been stronger than ever at a hope for a sequel to my favorite game of all time, and... One day I'll have my moment. But what I got instead, I can wait a little longer. Just a little. This is a really beautiful combination. You got Square Enix, who are effectively the kings and queens of the RPG as far as I'm aware, Platinum Games, who definitely know a thing or two on how to make a hack and slash game, all with Yoko Taro at the helm, whose mind may as well exceed all of us and is capable of telling one hell of a narrative. I bet he has a high IQ to understand a form of media that's well beyond our mental grasps. I'm glad Nier Automata exists, not only to remind people that Nier as a name can have potential, but also on its own celestial level. For real, I'm very thankful that it has a story that can stand on its own. That means I don't have to care too much. But maybe I should, because if there's any other information I would somehow be missing from an already compelling story with memorable characters and themes about what it means to be alive, that'd be pretty cool. Thankfully, it plays just as well as it tells a good story with a flashy, hacky, slashy RPG bullet hell gameplay. Unlike most, if not any RPG I've played, you can customize your chip to the point where you can even remove aspects of your HUD or even your entire OS, which is effectively a game over. But hey, let's be real, nothing of what I just said really means anything if you could just spend a majority of the game looking at 2B's ass. Good. You already know. Maybe if you've been paying a little extra attention to play a little Process by Elimination, or maybe my Twitter when I straight up said it might be my new favorite game, though maybe you realize how that turned out. But like I said before, I really thought about what I wanted to put at the top. But when I was looking at my rankings again and saw that it came back to the most famous video game character of them all, you know, it's almost fitting. Have you ever beaten a game and then spent most of your next playthrough actively trying to find issues with it because you begin to wonder how such a perfect game can even be made? Yeah, I'm still trying. It's like, I knew this game was gonna be amazing. I mean, that E3 trailer, damn. But little did I know that Nintendo would still find a way to fill this game to the brim with loads of shit to collect and many intricate level designs, and this game just oozes with so much charm. And have I ever mentioned that this was almost my favorite game? Definitely the best part here for me was the amount of control you have with Mario. Cappy is one of the most busted mechanics in a Mario game, and I love it so much. With the amount of movement you have, there's an incredibly high skill ceiling. And you know what? Nintendo even knew this by placing coin batches that not the average player would be able to get to, because placing moons would have deliberately forced those players to make that decision. You can take the normal way, or you can deliberately give yourself a challenge, and I really respect that. There aren't any lives in Mario Odyssey, which means that when you die, you lose coins, which not only does the game hand out like candy, but can also be spent on a whole bunch of crazy hats and outfits to choose from, and even to decorate your Odyssey. You can also use them to buy moons, and hey, no shame if you do if you want to make quick progression. But honestly, doing the latter would be an unfortunate disservice to the massive worlds and the jungle gym-esque layouts of things to do. It makes the overall odyssey, so to speak, an ultimately mundane one at that, because with the insane amount of moons you can collect, even in the post-game, you'd be missing out. Oh yeah, you can possess certain enemies which further allows for hefty exploration and more skills to do, but Super Mario Odyssey wants you to know that you're in for an adventure. The world is your sandbox and it wants you to discover everything it has, and like Breath of the Wild, it's on a console that you can even take on the go. 
I love video games. So that's gonna be it. Thank you all so much for watching. Sorry about not getting this video up on Christmas. I wanted more time to play some games and decide on the orders and yeah, you know. There's a lot I want to do this year and I can't wait to share it. So my name is Ty. I love you all in the most appropriate way and I'll see you guys next time.